Coral reefs are extremely important to humans. They, first of all, create an enormous amount of space. The reef itself has huge number of different spaces and pukas where other organisms live. So they are home to enormous biodiversity and a lot of what lives there ends up on our plate. So they are critical to food security. Secondly, they create a physical barrier around islands. And so when big waves come across the Pacific, say, they hit the coral reef. And the coral reef diminishes the storm energy and protects the land masses behind them. So they protect coastal environments. And lastly, you can't live in a place like Hawaii and not know that coral reefs are central to the tourist economy. People come to see them, and when they're here, they spend money here, and that's great for the place where the reef is. The corals are part of the history, culturally. The Kuvalipo, the creation chant for Native Hawaiians, identifies the polyp as kind of the, the precursor, the ancestor. Kumalipo, which means a source of darkness or origin, is a chant in the Hawaiian language telling the creation story of the earth. And the first thing that was brought forth was the coral polyp and then the coral colony. They believed that everything else, all other organisms were based, the foundation was from the corals because they saw how important those corals were to them. They used corals for sanding and abrading things. They used it in religious ceremony. They marked trails because you could see the white coral during the day or the night. Even their games like konane, which is similar to checkers, had white pieces along with the black pieces which were made from coral. Coral was, was and still is an extremely important part of the reef. It is obvious to see that the coral reef is a very important asset of the Hawaiian Islands. From providing protection from storms to food security and a deep-rooted cultural meaning. Yet it faces many dangers and the government is not doing much to help. That's quite scary when you realize that the reefs protect our island chain and they're so vital to the survival of Hawaii and, if you want to put it this way, to the survival of tourism industry. The tourism industry brings a great deal of money to Hawaii that helps our government function. Uh, the tourists pay a share of taxes and they also, through just keeping the economy going, help the islands. So if we are destroying or allowing something to degrade that brings the tourists here, that's going to really have an impact. And more than that, just take a look at the need to protect our island chain. We as legislators should be paying a lot more attention to this and putting in money in places where it's appropriate to help. If Hawaii's coral reefs disappeared, the state's economy would take an annual hit of $360 million. The reef is essential to the livelihood of the population as it provides food, drives the economy, and provides a cultural significance. Hawaii's reef is estimated at $10 billion. So the, the reefs obviously support a lot of our economy um, and general quality of life. Uh, so obviously we're a tourism-based economy here in Hawaii. People come to play on the beaches and snorkel and uh, the reefs are a, a key part of what people come to see. Um, they like to snorkel, they like to dive, uh, and the, see the fish, see the pretty colored corals, um, see the turtles. So the reefs are very important habitats um, for a lot of species that uh, people want to come and see. So that's one thing is the tourism industry, obviously, and that's a pretty obvious one. <clears throat> um, and as I mentioned, reefs are important habitat for a lot of sea creatures, um, some of which we eat. Um, so they are a really important part of the uh, ecological um, system that supports our fisheries. Um, and for a lot of people, those fisheries connect them to their culture. Uh, they're able to teach their children and grandchildren um, how to fish. And so as the reefs decline uh, and the fisheries decline, the cultural services of the reefs can also diminish. 
According to economists, the total recreational value the reef provides the state annually from snorkeling and diving is $304 million. Aside from tourism, researchers say the reef provides at least 2 million meals per year. Most of this nearshore fish that's being caught, that's reef fish like parrotfish, goatfish, uh, akuli and apelu, um, moi, all of that is being eaten mostly by local people here. So even though the dollar value is much smaller and the total volume of fish is much smaller, it's really important for the state in terms of household food security and uh, cultural values. And it's important too for the fishers because a lot of them aren't really making a profit. No one is really profiting off of nearshore fishing, but by selling part of their catch, it allows the fishers to recover their costs of fishing at least. So most of them aren't really generating profit. They're just selling enough fish to cover their costs. And the fish that you see in the markets, um, it really, it's only about a quarter of the total nearshore fish that we're catching. Most of it goes straight from whoever caught it to their family or to their friends or shared for a party or something. So that's where the importance of this fishery comes in. And that's why it hasn't gotten as much research attention maybe, because when you look at the total amount of commercial sales, it's so small. It looks almost insignificant. Like if it was to vanish tomorrow, the state economy really wouldn't feel it, but the people of Hawaii would really feel it. It's estimated that about 2.8 million pounds of fish are caught non-commercially. And there's a lot of people that We'll do that. The major stressors affecting coral reefs fall into three categories. The first one is land-based source of pollution. So that's due to things occurring on land, everything from clearing uh, to agriculture um, to the chemicals we use in our own homes. And that's a very big issue for Hawaii, that the distance between uh, source areas and in the ocean is extremely short. Um, we have big problems with sedimentation here. Um, probably the worst system I've ever seen with these concrete channels going from the mountains right into the ocean. When it rains, as water is running off the land, you see huge plumes of brown dirt that emerge in the ocean environment that relate to sediments that are from the land coming out onto the reef. And in that rainwater that comes onto the reef, you have masses of pollutants, things from our cars, jet fuels from the atmosphere, pollutants from agriculture. Corals are, like all organisms, covered in bacteria and usually the bacteria that you would find there would be bacteria that are related to the marine environment. But when you start to see human fecal bacteria on corals, and that water quality links to presence of human activity, and you know, in places like the north end of Kaniui Bay, all of those houses are on cesspools. Um, I'm an expert in that, in the area of how environment influences corals. And so sunscreens, they, many of them have um, oxybenzones in them. They are, are these, these really, these, um, there's a lot of chemicals in sunscreens that are not good for anybody, and not only corals, but not us. There's no question that urban development has exacerbated the problems. From a practical standpoint, I don't know that there's much we can do about that. It costs a tremendous amount to divert that water or to create wetlands or to otherwise mitigate those impacts. I'm thinking we may be able to do some of that, but our focus is probably going to be more on how we manage the ocean itself to make it more resilient. We do have city municipal laws that prevent um, grading projects that will allow runoff going into the reefs, but there's no enforcement. There are restrictions, but no enforcement. So it happens. And then again, we have the runoff, and then we have the degradation of the coral. Number two is overfishing, um, especially of the herbivores or the grazing fish. Um, these are basically the lawnmowers of the sea. Uh, there's a constant battle, especially in a place like Hawaii, where there's some nutrients and sediment getting into the water. Algae, fleshy algae, can outgrow the corals. And when you take away the uh, lawn mowing fish, the herbivorous fish, uh, then the algae will win every time. And we have many reefs in Hawaii that are covered over with algae, um, especially the invasive species that were brought in for aquaculture. Um, everybody's having an impact on the ocean, um, not just those that are, that are fishing. Um, but when you talk about uh, 
harvesting from the ocean. They're harvesting to feed their family. You have recreational fishers, and then you have commercial fishing. So there's just a lot of users, which has lent to a decline in, in our um, fish populations. And then climate change. You know, this is an El Nino year. We've seen probably the most extensive bleaching we've ever seen on our coral reefs here due to elevated water temperatures. Um, this is an El Nino year. This has been occurring more frequently than in the past and this is a window to the future. And bleaching is when the reef really turns white because it's showing signs of stress that relates to hot water and we've got very hot water around the world right now because of El Nino. So I think at the end of the day the answer to the question unless we change our behavior unless we reduce and mitigate fossil fuel burning on the planet and start to slow climate change I think the prognosis for coral reefs is very, very poor. Uh, it turns out that uh, corals are beautiful symbion uh, uh, symbiotic uh, organisms, so they are uh, polyps, so animals, but they live together with an algae, uh, dinoflagellates, and these dinoflagellates, they are very, very temperature sensitive. As it turns out, uh, beyond a certain temperature, they don't like to do their photosynthesis anymore, and, and then if that happens, the coral actually bleaches because the algae that, that provides all the sugar uh, to the polyp uh, essentially starves. Last year in Kaneohe Bay, there was a 1% mortality rate. So 1% of the corals actually died due to bleaching. This year, it looks like it's going to be a lot higher, not only here, Maui, and other places that are being surveyed. So this year, they're really ramping up and doing more intensive surveys so we can see how bad this bleaching is going to be. If we continue to burn fossil fuels at the rate we've been doing, which is business as usual, the reefs have no future. They have no chance at all. What people don't understand is the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are not going to decrease. Even if all emissions were to end today, there still will be more carbon coming in. And they don't understand that this is on a geologic scale. It doesn't happen year to year. It happens on time scales of 10 to hundreds to thousands of years. So you're not looking at short time periods of recovery. The carbon is going to be there. And we are expecting a two degrees centigrade rise even if all emissions were to end today, we're still going to get two degrees. Now, two degrees doesn't sound like much, but when you think about what the thermal tolerances of corals are, Paul Joaquil, who had looked at this back in the early 70s, found that temperature ranges for corals are between one and two degrees centigrade of their summer maximum temperatures. So that's as much as they can tolerate. So I think the rates of change in the environment uh, are now so rapid that in many ways they are, these rates are overwhelming the innate capacity of the coral to survive on the long term. And so, you know, to give you a, a, a statistic, in 1998 there was a large warming event in the water associated with the El Nino and 18% of the world's reefs died as a result of that one event. And, and many people would say, if business continues as usual, that the majority of the world's reefs will be massively degraded by 2050. It's not a time emergency, but it is a hugely critical problem. If you look at the Caribbean um, and the, what's happened to the reefs in the Caribbean in response to uh, coral bleaching that they saw before Hawaii ever experienced any, They've got some severe problems with coral reef die-off. And uh, we have an opportunity to learn from what's happened there and to try to uh, prepare ourselves and prepare our reefs for the best recovery possible. But in the long run, it's a big problem. One of the difficult things about our Department of Land and Natural Resources, it has a huge vital task to perform and it's severely underfunded. So when you take a look at, if you do a pipe shaped chart out of the money that's appropriated by the legislature, you'll see a large, large comp will go for education as it should, and then there are a lot of other different areas that will get some of the 
sections of a pie chart. I think you almost have to pull out a magnifying glass and look at that pie chart to be able to say, where is the section that goes to the Department of Land and Natural Resources? That's again, when you get back to educating lawmakers and educating uh, the administration to say, we need to do this for the preservation of our coral reefs and the preservation of our islands. Reef conservation begins on land. You know, here I'm a marine biologist, but I spend a lot of my time working on land-based issues just because we know that things we're doing on land today are affecting the corals immediately. Um, the best plan is to have retention of water and sediment and chemicals on land where they're supposed to be. Um, what we see happening is in a rainstorm, you get these plumes of sediment coming out. It's actually pushing the corals away from shore. And in some cases, there's a limit to how far they can go before they're simply pushed off the edge and there's no longer any habitat. Um, proper planning includes on-site retention of water, on-site retention of chemicals. We really need to not only look for protecting our reefs by holding water on land, but it's a smart thing to do economically as well, to be able to put the water back into use. Um, as we joke with people, if you don't like paying five bucks a gallon for gas, you're going to hate paying five bucks a gallon for water. We need to curb our carbon emissions. Everybody knows we can reduce, reuse, recycle. Some of the things they may not know are thinking about everything you buy. What's the true cost of what you're buying? What's the cost to the environment? What is it actually taking to make what it, you're buying? How are you going to dispose of it? Can you recycle it when you're finished using it? These are things that people don't often think of. So trying to eat locally can also really help. And another big thing is eating less meat. Meat goes up a whole scale. It's 10 times more costly than vegetables, which means it takes 10 pounds of soybeans or corn to produce one pound of beef or pork and a lot of water. So if you eat less meats, this also can help us to curb these carbon emissions. Just begun the development of a, a comprehensive coral reef management plan. The plan will be looking at, at all the things that we can do here in Hawaii that might help to increase the resiliency of coral reefs in the event of a bleaching event or the recovery of those reefs once a bleaching event has occurred. In our work here, we're in this incredible situation, right? We're at the University of Hawaii's Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. This institute is sitting on a living reef in a bay with, that gives us access to 52 other living reefs, has a boundary reef around the outside of it, and fringing reefs on the inside. It's nowhere else in the world can you have such direct access to the reef. And so what that enables us to do then is to take corals from the reef and bring them into laboratory settings. A lot of our work recreates the conditions of the future. So we expose corals from our reefs here today to the conditions that we think will be on the reefs in 10, 20, and 30 years. It's important to identify what makes those corals more resistant and what makes corals more susceptible. So right now we're trying to identify those corals of the same species that are in the same environment, why one coral will be bleaching and the other coral will not bleach. And we believe that those may be the coral itself or the algal symbiont inside of the coral or also some microbes that are associated with the coral. So we're trying to identify why this coral is bleaching and why this coral is not bleaching. And if we know that, we can have a better idea of how they're going to respond to the future and some, maybe some ways that we can mitigate what's going on and how we can help the corals. The rule is to not let the reef die. So I would say the, the, the rule number one is never let us take nature that far where there is nothing left to, to, to work with. So there are ways to invigorate coral reefs that have been damaged by either human activities or by, say, a, a grounding of a ship. You know, you can plant corals. Corals are amazing. You can 
cut them into many pieces. They are clones, these pieces, of the big original colony. And you could plant those on the reef and you can reinvigorate, really essentially through a farming of the corals. And the coral farms now coming to be all over the world. So, but you know, if I had one thing to say, it's, you know, lobby everybody to reduce fossil fuels. Let's stop the problem, let's stop the damage to reef before it creates the problem of having no reef at all. And a few years ago through the Hawaii Coral Reef Initiative, we actually had a um, company perform a survey of the community of what we call willingness to pay, meaning how important are coral reefs to you and their health. And the results were very surprising to me. Um, they looked at various groups of people, including those that identified as rarely going to the beach, less than once a month. When they go to the beach, they just sit on the sand and they don't go on the water, and that they never really stick their head under the water at all. But when the question came up, how do you value reefs and how much do you think we should invest in protecting them, it was very high. And I thought it was a mistake in the survey, and I went back and said, something's not right here. These are people who don't use the reef, they don't snorkel on the reef, they don't even see the reef, and yet they valued it high. Can you go back in and check the demographic and figure out what went wrong? And they called a number of the people that were involved in these phone surveys, and they said, you self-identified as not really using the reef, yet you valued it high. Was this a mistake? And it was very interesting to me, as people said, I don't have to see it to need to know that it's OK. If I'm driving over the poly or the leaky leaky in the morning, and I see the ocean, I just need to know it's OK. It's If it's not for me, I need to know it's OK for my kids. And in retrospect, it's not that surprising. I think it is one of the nice things about humans that we can appreciate things. And that starts with individuals. Uh, the recent paper, again, on sunscreen, there are alternatives to the sunscreens that are known to be damaging to coral reefs. There are better activities we can do on land to prevent erosion and sedimentation. We can restrict the kinds of pollutants we use on land that will eventually end up in the ocean. We can work together to not only establish marine protected areas, but to enforce them as a community so that we don't have to li limit ourselves to the three or four um, uh, officers on island who can't possibly can patrol the area, but to be able to do it through peer-to-peer -peer and through voluntary um, actions that help the reef come back as well. And we need to have people pay attention. There's so many competing needs and interests for the limited resources, financial resources that we have as a state. And so if there isn't a voice speaking for the coral, the coral silently dies. So there's no one thing that we should really be doing. We should be doing everything we can to protect our reef. And you know, from the global to the local, we should be acting to protect our reef where we live.